Working is brought to you by Progressive. Are you thinking more about how to tighten up your budget these days? Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. My instinct always as a director is to not know more than the play knows because my job is to communicate the play as best I can to the audience. And if I go and do too much research, I'll be shoving in too many of my own ideas into it. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, June Thomas. And I'm your other host, Isaac Butler. Isaac, it's always so nice to see you. But before we get into it, I must know whose voice we heard at the top of the show. That was the very talented, multi-hyphenate Patrick Marber, who got his start in comedy. He was a stand-up comic, and then he co-created Alan Partridge with Steve Whoa. Coogan and Armando Iannucci, uh, and then eventually became a writer, most f- famously of the play Closer, which was made into a movie directed by Mike Nichols, uh, and stage director. Oh, a theatre person. Excellent. Indeed. And why did you want to speak with him right now? Well, he is helming the new Tom Stoppard play, Leopoldstadt, on Broadway. It's a play that chronicles a family of wealthy, assimilated Jews in Vienna from about 1899 to the 1950s in a little over two hours. Whoa. (laughs) I am very excited to hear the interview, but I believe that you have an extra segment just for Slate Plus members. What will they hear? Well... Yes, we do. Patrick and I are both Jews, and uh, this is a play about Jews, and it's kind of a Jewish identity play, and they clearly worked hard to make sure the Jews in the play were played by Jewish actors. And so I wanted to talk to him about that and about whether Jewish roles have to be played by Jews or not. If you are a member of Slate Plus, you'll hear that at the end of the episode. And if you aren't, it's really easy to join. And listen to this. For a limited time, you can get six months of Slate Plus for just $29. That's 50% off. As a member, you'll get no ads on any of our podcasts, unlimited reading on the Slate site, and member exclusive episodes and segments from our show and other shows like Slow Burn, Amicus, Political Gabfest, and so on. Slate's podcasts cover major news events from elections to social issues to historic court decisions. Our shows also discuss what makes a song a smash, analyze what's going viral, and decode cultural mysteries. And if we've become a part of your listening routine, we ask that you support our work by joining Slate Plus. Sign up for Slate Plus now at slate.com slash working plus to access all Slate's content and support our work. Again, that's just $29 for six months through February 28th. So sign up now at slate.com slash working plus. All right, let's hear Isaac's conversation with Patrick Marber. In your early career, you did stand up. You uh, helped co-create Alan Partridge. You're a successful playwright. You've acted. You're a director with a new show on Broadway. Um, Is there some catch-all title you give to all of this? I'm a writer director. um, uh, And I like doing both. Um, Sometimes I've directed my own writing. Quite often directed other people's writing. um, I adapt things. I sometimes write original things. I'm I'm a very restless person. I have ADHD and I get bored very quickly and I need constant stimulation. Uh, and I dread writing, but I rather like directing. Um, which is not to say I don't enjoy my writing when I'm doing it, but I find it very hard to concentrate. 
is uh, that dread overcome because you're, I don't know, you're writing the kind of thing you want to direct? Is that why you write, might write a play? Or is it, you know, does your directing influence your writing process, I guess is what I'm asking? Very rarely, because I, it's only when I get to the end of something that I think, oh, I'd quite like to direct this, or absolutely no, I don't want to direct it. Uh, so my directing choices are, are very distinct from uh, writing choices. I just write the thing uh, and then much, much later have a feeling that, that I might want to direct it. And sometimes I like directing revivals of my plays that other people have done 10 years before. And then I might take another look at the play um, and have a go myself. Mm. That's fascinating. Now, the, the flip of that question is, do you feel like as a director, you know, particularly having seen your peers work or talk to them or whatever, that the fact that you are also a writer shapes how you approach script and production as a director? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons Tom Stoppard let me direct uh, his new play, because we worked together on uh, a revival of his play, Travestis, that came to... Um, New York in 2018, we did it in London in 2016 and 17. And I think he liked my approach, which was, you know, with a certain knowledge of how a writer works and thinks and feels. Um, I wouldn't pretend to know how Tom Stoppard works and thinks and feels, but uh, it, I think it really helped bond us because I, I pay great attention to the writing and try and understand every comma and period and semicolon and um, exactly what the writer is intending to say. Uh, so I don't, I try not to interpret too much as a director. I just want to deliver the play as I believe the writer wrote it. Ah, yeah, right, right. Not make a big stylistic statements or... Uh... Exactly, and what helps in that respect is because really I, I'm a... Mm, I make my living as a writer, primarily. So directing is a pleasure. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd say I'm a semi-professional director and a professional writer. Um, and so I'm quite relaxed when I'm directing because my next gig is not dependent on the success of this particular show. So that yeah, helps. Yeah. I'm a more relaxed director than I am a relaxed writer. Okay, I know uh, that Tom Stoppard's work has been very important to you for much of your, since you were a teenager, if I remember correctly, right? I mean, I think you had an experience very much like I did and many of my friends did of encountering a Tom Stoppard play at an early age and being kind of like, what the fuck is this? This is the smartest thing I've ever read and falling in love with his work and everything like that. So what's it like to give notes to someone whose career has been that important to you, that's been that whose work you've been following was kind of a hero of yours. I mean, I know you two have worked together before, but that that's got to be a bit of an odd experience. It is, and I I regularly pinch myself when I'm uh, talking to Tom or sat in a coffee shop with him and uh, doing our notes and talking through the show. Um, if you'd have told me. 10 years ago or 20 years ago or at any time really that one day I'd be saying no Tom I disagree I think that's not right um or whatever or hey great idea Tom thanks yes I'll do that tonight um I wouldn't have believed it possible um but I guess you know when you meet people who are your heroes I mean I work with Mike Nichols and he was a legend to me um he directed the film of Closer, my play, and I spent a lot of time with Mike um, uh, in the early noughties. Um, and I think it really, they, the older guy sets the tone, really. If they're relaxed with you, you can relax with them. And with both Mike and Tom, they, they don't make me feel like the kid. I mean, I'm not a kid, I'm 58, but you feel like the kid when you're, talking to your older heroes. So they set the tone and it it feels a bit weird and then it's not weird at all, you're just working. 
Right. Right. Um, Leopoldstadt, like many of Tom Stoppard's plays, is throwing a lot of ideas and real life figures at the audience uh, 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 from the get go. Right. I, if I remember correctly, the first five minutes alone, you're, it references uh, Herzl and Klimt and Freud and Schnitzler. Right. Um was this a milieu, the turn of the century in Viennese assimilated Jewish society? Was was this a milieu you were super familiar with or did you do a ton of research or, you know, what was that process like for you? I mean, I knew it a bit from movies and stuff, um, you know, but I didn't really know this period particularly well. And I, I read the books and I, you know, looked at the pictures uh, uh, but my instinct always as a director is to not know more than the play knows because my job is to communicate the play as best I can to the audience. And if I go and do too much research, I'll be shoving in too many of my own ideas into it, whereas I want to communicate the play's ideas. And what, what the playwright writes is the given information, the, the information the playwright considers sufficient for the audience to receive and enjoy the play. Um, when I directed a, a Harold Pinter play, an early Harold Pinter play called The Caretaker. Wonderful play. Yeah, wonderful play. And I was fortunate enough to be in the rehearsal room with Harold. He was very much around during rehearsals and the, talking about the production and who we should cast and how we should do it. Um, and he was adamant that everything you need to know about the play is in the play. Um, I never once asked him, well, where did this come from? And what do you think this character's like? And do you think this or that? Because his whole artistic position was, it's all there for you. And if I've left something out, I've left it out for a reason. And if I haven't given this particular moment backstory or precedent or whatever you that's that's what you have to live with he, he was like a painter the painting is the painting it's not it's not some other thing that is a reference to something else um the play is is a piece of music or a painting and it contains exactly what it needs to contain um and you shouldn't you shouldn't investigate things that aren't there was his view Obviously, actors find that very challenging because actors like to imagine the whole life of their characters. Um, some actors do, some don't. Um, it's always very interesting to me the difference between actors. They're all individuals. They all have a different process. Um, I remember talking to... I directed a play um, set in middle of 19th century Russia um, a play by Turgenev that I'd adapted. And it was called Three Days in the Country. It was my shorter version of A Month in the Country. <laughs> right. And the guy playing the doctor in it, the funny doctor part, brilliant actor called Mark Gatiss, who you might know from um, League of Gentlemen and the TV show, and he wrote Sherlock with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. And he's a brilliant guy. Very funny actor. And he was playing a doctor in it. And um, in the scene, he'd, he'd just ridden to the big country house on his horse from his home. And I remember saying to him, so Mark, um, you, you know, you're Dr. Spigelski. Uh, uh, how long did the ride take you from home? And he said, oh, I've no idea. I said, okay, uh, how long have you been a doctor? No idea. Um, what what colour is your horse? No idea. What's it called? No idea. What's in your doctor's bag? Absolutely nothing. I've never looked in it. He had no process of backstory or anything. He just came on, said the lines beautifully, won the Olivier Award and went home. You know, he. whereas some other actors were writing journals every day in the life of their character. Um, and neither process... No process is better necessarily one or another. Um, but it's always very interesting to me how much people need to know about a thing to be able to do a thing. Hmm. Yeah, and you know, you're you're sort of segueing to part of the 
really weird job of, of directing or part of the weird job of it. I, I am a director as well as a writer. And so I have some experience of this is, um, navigating the differences in processes that exist within your cast and being able to, you know, uh, what is it? Prince Hal says, speak, speak to a tinker in his own tongue, right? Being able to speak to each of them in a way that is, that is, um, helpful to them, that gives them what they need so that they can do their jobs. Um, how, how do you approach that in the rehearsal room? I mean, particularly in the new production of Leopoldstadt, I mean, you have American actors and English actors who famously often have very different processes. And, uh, how, how do you, how are you doing that in the room? Well, I'm, I'm really trying to watch carefully and listen carefully to what each actor needs. Um, and they, as you say, they need such different things at different times. Um, it's, um, it's a really difficult job directing. Um, uh, if you're, if you care about how your actors feel, I mean, some directors don't, uh, they just go, this is how we're doing it. And you fit into my jigsaw puzzle. Um, and their relationship with the actors is very distant. That's a way of doing it. Um, it's not my way because I think a rehearsal room should be kind of fun and creative. Um, can't always be sometimes you just have to run the stuff um until you're dying but uh i want it to be fun for them and i want it to be fun for me otherwise i might as well go and work in a bank you know my my whole thing was i want to be in showbiz um to not have a proper job um i, I don't want to work for the man i want to you know um wear what i want um and sleep well at night because i'm doing something i love so in terms of process, yeah, each actor is an individual. You, you call them the company, but they're, they're not really the company. They're a bunch of individuals who all have different needs and wants, and you have to tune into them. Um, uh, and it's tricky. Sometimes you get it wrong. Hopefully, if you're the, the older I've got, the more I've tended to get it right. Um, but yeah, you make mistakes and you mistreat people by mistake and then you have to apologize and it's, it's a whole thing. Uh, I think I can only I can only direct once or twice a year. It's too too exhausting uh, emotionally. Well, especially because when you're in rehearsal, you know, you're the one who's doing the most performing <laughs> because you have to like you have the persona. You have to be nurturing the room. You have to be figuring out, you know, you're, it's like you're an improv not comic. It's like you're an improv actor at all times in these, you know, long rehearsals. It's, it's very tiring. You're not allowed to despair in the rehearsal room other than comically uh, as a director. You, yeah. You've got to keep people's spirits up uh, and keep the energy up. Even if you're feeling this is so not working, this is terrible. Oh, what a mistake I've made. Um, uh, but it was like that. I'm used to that because when I was a stand up. And, you know, there were days when I was completely depressed and I'd have to go on stage because I had a booking and um, had some gig to do in some far flung place. And I had to get in my car and drive there, drive 100 miles to go and entertain people when all I wanted to do was hide under the bed sheets, you know. So I'm kind of used to uh, impersonating a human being who's happy to be there. Most I of the time now I am happy to be there, but. You know, look, it's like you hosting this podcast. You know, I'm sure there are days, maybe today, maybe right now, when you, the, the last thing you want to be doing is talking to me, but you're doing a very good job of making me feel comfortable talking to you. It's the art, isn't it? It's the unseen art. Well, I, I do appreciate that because it's something I work hard at. Although I am happy to be here uh, today in this very odd hotel room I'm in. But yeah. <laughs> We'll be back with more of Isaac's conversation with Patrick Marber. This episode of Working is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection, the latest innovation from Discover? Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. 
This episode is supported by Remote Works, an original podcast from Citrix. Hybrid work is here to stay, and Remote Works is here to help. Remote Works explores the challenges and best practices of the new normal with true stories from the trenches of the hybrid workplace. The podcast features personal stories and expert interviews about the challenges of technology, trust, collaboration, and flexibility in hybrid work. In the Metaverse episode of Remote Works, host Melanie Green speaks with organizational behavior professor Jana Raver to discuss the importance of balancing the in-person and virtual work experiences so all employees feel valued. Search for Remote Works in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. Thanks to Remote Works for their support. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we answer listener questions. So please tell us your creative challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at workingatslate.com. You can also send a voice memo to that address or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to Isaac's conversation with Patrick Marber. I have a friend, a director friend, who refers to the week after first run through as the dark cloud because it's just like the week after first run through, everything you do feels wrong and you feel like you're never going to crack the problems in the play. And the part of the director's job is just to remain upbeat through that period, even though what they actually want to do is throw themselves out the window. And I, I think that's a very kind of like uh, apropos what, what directing can really be like. Yes. I tell you what really what really comforted me in this job working with Stoppard is because I witnessed the c- composition of this play, the desire to write it, the desire to write a play from Tom before he had a play, as it were. And so it took him, you know, years to force this play out of himself and onto the page. And I thought, well if Tom Stoppard struggles it's okay for everyone to struggle. You know, he's he's a really smart guy and he didn't know what to do. He was stuck. And then he came out with this this amazing fully formed work of art, if I may say so. Um so everyone struggles. That's the point. It's always difficult for everyone, however experienced they are. Yeah, right. Yes, of course. Um are you a table work person? Do you like to spend a lot of time around the table, seated with the script, going through it with the actors, or or do you want to get up on your feet as quickly as possible? I, I like to um, chat about the scene, but I think you discover the scene more by putting it on its feet. So I like to get the actors up on their feet quite early. I like them speaking the lines early with purpose. So we do lots of work on intention and the action of the scene and what's happening but I don't really like to discuss the meaning of the scene until the scene is on its feet. Because I think meaning is apparent or becomes apparent by doing it. And I think on stage, doing it is everything. They're gonna have to do it eventually. So right. why why pretend otherwise by discussing it? That was actually uh, one of the things that uh, Stanislavski came around to late in life was let's just get it up, right? Because you got to get it up and then you figure out what it means. Don't figure out what it means and then and then get it up first. That was something he kind of changed his mind about in the last 15 years of his uh, career. And I, I also trust the playwright that the, the meaning of the scene is contained in the correct speaking of the words in the right order um, with the right purpose. Stoppard's done the work. He's done the meaning work for us. We don't have to chip in with our own meaning it it's there um, and and right. if you present the play clearly enough uh the meaning will emerge and the double meaning and the triple meaning and the under meaning and the over meaning and all these things that are in play like music you can't direct that not really you can allude to it but the meaning is sprung in the words Right, right. And are you are you someone who does pre-blocking? Are you coming in with the scene staged? Or do you want to see what the actor's impulses are and then shape those impulses? Or It, it really varies, but I think um, it depends what your, desi- your set designer has come up with. I mean, 
in this production, um, there's always a table upstage it's somewhere, it moves around, and there's always some chairs downstage. And that really controls where the actors can go or not go. There's a piano on stage throughout the play, a table, various chairs. Those are the building blocks of the, of the production. And those were the necessary things to provide for the stage, for the correct staging of the play. I mean, yeah, we could have staged it all in a plastic bubble, um, uh, but it wouldn't have quite been right for Vienna in 1899. But you could do that. But in, in other words, the blocking is kind of imposed on the actors by the design. And the design is something that was done years ago. Uh, we first right. we first did rehearse this play in 2019. Um, winter of 2019 was when the first iteration of Leopoldstadt was rehearsing in London. Um, so I have a completely open mind to the blocking, but I also know it has to exist within certain parameters given to us long ago by the designer. And when I have to imagine in the larger, you know, sort of full cast scenes... There's probably some of that stage pictures really worked out in advance because it's like, well, where is this conversation taking place? And these people are all sitting down. Where are they going to sit? Whereas I imagine something like the confrontation scene with Fritz, which is just a two hander, you know, played at the front of the stage. The actors might have a little more freedom to kind of feel that, you know, when am I going to cross away from Fritz? When am I going to cross towards Fritz? I'm going to take those impulses in the moment a little bit more. Exactly. Yeah, I've been directing two hander, three hander, four hander scenes all my life. Um, but directing the, the group scenes where you've got 15 people on stage who all need to be seen um, and need to be grouped beautifully but still feel a certain level of freedom to move, that's, that's very challenging. Plus you've got children who need to be seen and there are different requirements for getting them seen. Generally they can't be heard if they're upstage, so you've got to try and get your kids downstage. But I love that, um, and I think... Neil Austin has lit Leopoldstadt so beautifully that you get shards of light and golden light and all different kinds of lighting states, but there are times when I look at it and it does feel like a painting. And that, that was intended. Right, right. Um, you just mentioned the child actors. Uh, um, there's a number of them in the play. Many of them are also on stage during or at least one of them's on stage during the play's most upsetting scene, which is when the Nazis come to evict the, the mayor's family from their home. H had you directed children before? You know, what, what is that like, particularly given how intense the story of the, the play ends up being? Yeah, I've directed kids quite a lot, actually. Uh, I wrote a play called Howard Katz um, that was that I put on in 2001 that had a kid in it and Three Days in the Country as a kid, but I'd, I'd never had a group of kids before. Um, and I have an assistant director whose responsibility is to make sure the kids are seen and heard in the right places. So he's, he's a guy called Ed, and he he's really done the bulk of the work with the kids. I just say where I want them and where, uh, and what the tone of it is, but he gets them heard. Um, so hats off to him. Uh, the kids are brilliant. There's, we, we rehearse with the adults for two or three weeks, and the day the kids arrive and start saying their lines, it's kind of wonderful. Um, it adds a whole other texture to the play and the production, because up till then the adults have been playing their childhood selves. So they enjoy doing that because they're sort of looking at, they're remembering stuff that, happen to them as children but then the actual kids come and um yeah it's a whole thing you have to have a an in intimacy director who makes sure that the space is safe and that it's that the kids feel comfortable about the adults picking them up or giving them a hug you know it's a whole it's a whole thing but it's kind of good uh, it it starts to make the play feel like a family play um and we've got a brilliant bunch of kids uh in New York and they're, they're hilarious and they're enthusiastic and quite frankly, the most professional people on the stage. I mean, they really are. <laughs> and some of them are gonna be stars. I mean, I'm, one day uh, I'll be talking about how I once worked with 
you know, this kid who's now burning up Broadway. You know, I, I feel that. That's great. Um, so now that the show's come to Broadway, there are a few things that have, have changed. And I just wanted to, to talk about them with you. One of them is that it's, if I recall correctly, shorter than the London production by a little bit and now presented without an intermission, whereas before it had two acts. Um, what led to that decision and how did you and Stop Art work on cutting it and, and getting it into this sort of one act one long act because it's still two hours long or, but uh, two hours and change. But you know, what was the process of condensing it and why did you decide to do that? Tom always wanted the play to be played straight through without an intermission. And when we started rehearsing it, uh, it was probably going to last, it was probably going to run for about two hours, 20, two hours, 25. And I said, that's too long to be holding them here. I said, you're gonna to have to cut it if you want that. And he wasn't at the time inclined to make the cuts. Um, he wanted, you know, quite understandably, he'd written this whole thing. And we said, well, let's see how it goes during rehearsal. And in the end, we decided to present it with an interval in London. Then the pandemic happened. So we opened the play, we ran for seven weeks. Then the pandemic happened, we closed, and we didn't reopen again for another 16, 17 months. Um, and during that period, Tom and I talked uh, quite a lot about, well, when we, when we come back, what do we want to do? What changes do we want to make? And Tom and I took out enough material and pages to be able to present it in one breath. So by the time we remounted it in London in August 2021, <clears throat> we did it without intermission and we, we knew it was better. It had better momentum, uh, it felt swifter, um, and the audience um, responded accordingly. It was a more epic journey. Um, but I should say there are, there are sort of uh, intentionally quite long scene changes every now and then. So you get a minute to just kind of stretch. Um, and I think, I think of those as mini intermissions. Um, so it's not like you have to concentrate solidly for two hours. You get breaks. In dance, don't they call that the pause, right? When there's like, it's not, you're not really supposed to leave the space, but you can at least, uh, you know, yeah. stretch a little bit. Patrick Marber, thank you so much for joining us to talk about your process and about Leah Polchdott. Thank you. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection, the latest innovation from Discover? Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. Support for this podcast comes from WISE, the universal account made for moving money around the world. 170 countries, 50 currencies, one account. Who exactly is WISE made for? It's made for Austrians uprooting to Australia, Swedes safariing in South Africa. It's made for business in Tokyo and pleasure in Miami. With WISE, you can send, spend, or receive money internationally all in one account. It's a convenient way to move your money across borders. You'll get the mid-market exchange rate with no markups and fees that are always low and transparent. WISE Business is the only business account you need to go global. It has everything you need to grow and operate your multi-currency business without the hefty admin and headache of a local bank. Join 13 million people and businesses who are already saving. Learn more about how the WISE account could work for you at wise.com slash slate. Isaac, 
as you know, I love a bit of director on director action. So <laughs> is that I, is that I, is that your kink, June? Director on director is, action. It, is, it might it might be it might well be yeah. Uh, so I especially enjoyed that interview, and I was really fascinated by his recollections of working with a series of older men who are just objectively among the true greats: Mike Nichols, Tom Stoppard, Harold Pinter. How. In such situations, the older guy sets the tone, and as Patrick memorably put it, it's weird until it isn't. It's such an amazing opportunity to learn and just to kind of sit at their feet. That sounds so kind of pathetic, but I mean, come on. Theatre and music and maybe movies and TV facilitate or actually kind of require that kind of collaboration Whereas other media like nonfiction and fiction writing really don't, I think. But there are always ways to create collaborations. Have you ever had a chance to work closely with an older artist you've admired for a long time? Well, yeah. I mean, first off, I should say that theater and to a certain extent film, you know, historically transmitted knowledge and expertise through formal and informal apprenticeship systems. So like ah. in the studio system of Hollywood, if you were the new actor in a movie, the older actor would take you under the wing and show you how to act for the camera and, and, and stuff mm. like that. A lot of that, particularly in the theater world, has been supplanted by things like the MFA degree. But I do think that at least informal apprenticeship system still really exists. Mm. Now, the closest I have gotten to that outside of theater is actually with the writer Jonathan Lethem, who's a friend and was a guest in the first season of yes. this uh, reboot of Working It Out. He was, I think, then the age that I am now, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Unlike Harold Pinter, Mike Nichols, and Tom Stopper, when Patrick is working with them or towards the end of their careers and lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Jonathan was in his 40s, but he asked me, we had just met and he had seen a play of mine, I think. And he asked me to help him adapt a short story of his into a performance piece that was performed in this very odd salon series that was hosted in a Starbucks in Soho for two <laughs> weeks. It was just like one of those weird things, you know? And um, yeah, yeah. And so we worked on it together for a week or two and I adapted it and we rehearsed it and we performed it together. And it's actually, you know, kind of where our friendship began. And uh, uh, as Patrick says, it was weird until it wasn't. You know, it's odd to <laughs> to take someone else's text especially yeah. a writer you admire that much and be like well I'm gonna monkey with it to make it actable <laughs> um, but he was very open to that you know he really wanted it to be adapted he really wanted my ideas and so so I that that idea of the more established artist setting the tone I think really rings true well the next time I go to the theater I'll be thinking about the notion that Marva articulated that the information the playwright provides should be sufficient for the audience, and then by extension for the actors and the whole creative team. What's your philosophy of extra textual content? <laughs> well, you know that I love research, June. I uh, do. So I actually feel as a director, you should be doing as much research as humanly possible. I would <laughs> not limit myself, as Patrick does, to knowing what the characters know. You know what I mean? Because you never know yeah. what ideas images, motifs, etc., are going to kind of crop up as a result of that research and inspire you. But I absolutely agree with him that the audience only gets to see it once. And so anything you need them to really grasp and understand on like a concrete level, you have to make sure that you can get that over on one viewing, on one listening, you know? Like, yeah. like, like you have to ditch any big idea that that can't be transmitted to the audience in a in a good faith hearing of the play. Now, yeah. that said, you can have lots of other stuff going on that doesn't work on the rational level or that is sort of coloring the experience in ways the audience doesn't totally rationally get. Mm -hmm. But the things you want them to understand, you really only have one shot and you've got to take it wisely. Yeah. That reminds me, Helen Shaw had an amazing review of Leopoldstadt in a recent New Yorker. And she talks about how basically she kind of recommends that people who go to see the play, like do read all this stuff and kind of inform themselves, um, you know, because that way the, the experience will be rewarded. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, view of supplemental, you yeah. know, just before you go. 
Check this out. Meanwhile, uh, you know, Carol Churchill, the playwright Carol Churchill, doesn't want the audience to know anything about the play before they go. Mm. You know, she used to, there was a period of her career where they gave you the program when the play was over. Oh my God. Like they didn't, they just, you know, her whole thing was like, you experience what you experience, you get out of it what you get out of it. You don't have to understand everything. It's a, it's a thing you're coming to and just, just be in the room and and get whatever you get out of it, which is, um, I think very brave, but, (laughs) but but not, not, not what, how I would direct her plays necessarily. Yeah. 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 Well, as as we've said in the past, we're both big admirers. So whatever Carol wants. Exactly. I have not yet seen Leopoldstadt, but just hearing about the challenges of finding a way for 15 actors on stage to be seen and heard, I'm struck by the move toward small cast productions in recent years. First of all, I wonder, is that really a thing or is that just a reflection of what I've seen? But if it is true, is the work of managing that many people on stage a dying art just because people don't get a chance to learn how to do it? Did you ever direct pieces with that many mm. people on stage? It, absolutely, the move is towards smaller casts. Mm, absolutely. Okay. I mean, Tom Stoppard loves throwing a bajillion people on stage. <laughs> yeah. And he has the clout to command the budgets where he can do that. Right. But but often, if you see sort of, if there's more than four bodies on stage, it feels like a friggin' miracle sometimes. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I do think that it's an art directing that many bodies on stage. Um, I've directed Shakespeare, you know, uh, and that is usually as 12 to 14 people, you know, in it. They're maybe not always on stage, but you have to, at some point you're going to have to arrange that many bodies. Um, the two big multimedia pieces I did at BAM, Real Enemies and Brooklyn Babylon had an 18 piece big band on stage, but of course they're sitting down the whole time playing music, you know, (laughs) so, so that's much easier staging for 15 bodies is really hard staging for two to three bodies can also be hard because it can get really really boring you know Uh, how many ways can you arrange two bodies that tell a story and look compelling and are also realistic and you don't want them to be on the same uh horizontal plane and all this stuff it's very frustrating and three can be hard because eventually you're just doing triangles (laughs) you know everything (laughs) just turns into a triangle and it starts to feel like a math puzzle um four to six is really the the most fun i would say personally i have the most fun staging like five five people on stage is really like chef's kiss the best (laughs) no i just want to go to the theater and just count how many people are on the stage and what shapes they're in Uh, I was really taken with your question about table work. Mm. It sounds like Patrick Marber is keen to get the actors up and speaking the lines as soon as reasonably possible. But I'm now very curious about the issues underlying your question. Can you talk me through the benefits of extensive table work? Yes, totally. So table work is really first instituted as a general rehearsal practice by Konstantin Stanislavski. And Stanislavski? Vladimir. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. We should get up. We should do Should we do a little, we need like a little ding every time I say Stanislavski on the show. Anyway, <laughs> uh, by Stanislavski and his partner, Vladimir Nemirovich Donchenko, when they start the Moscow Art Theater. It's a literary theater. That's the whole idea is that its mm. focus is on great, great works of literary and theatrical merit. And so about a quarter of the rehearsal process is spent around a table reading through the play on a granular level, making sure there's a shared understanding of the play and its ideas and what's happening moment to moment and its style and and et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. You have a lot of discussions. And um, that makes its way over to the United States, like a lot of other Stanislavski's ideas in the (laughs) 20s. That becomes a very important part of the group theaters process. So as those ideas start to take over the American theater, that becomes a really big deal. I remember reading an interview with um, Zelda Fishhandler, who who founded the arena stage and is one of the most important, you know, directors of the regional theater movement of the mid 20th century. And she like they had a resident company. So those people were paid a weekly salary. And um, they did table work forever. You'd read this interview and she'd be like, well, we do like three weeks of table work. And then eventually people naturally start standing up and then I start blocking. So it used to be the table work was a really, really big deal. The it, the pendulum is starting to swing away from that. Uh, I've had a lot of informal conversations with directors who say they're fed up with table work. They don't <laughs> want to be around a table. They want to read it a couple times and get it on its feet. If there's any questions they have when it's on the feet, they can always go back to the table. There's still a table yeah. in the room. You know, it's not <laughs> like you've lit the table on fire. Um, uh, and to try to find different 
ways to do it. Now, part of that is that rehearsal processes are getting shorter, but Uh. I think there's the idea that maybe we've gotten too analytical and too intellectual and we need to get back into the body and the physical presence, which is actually something Stanislavski himself (laughs) began to believe during the last 20 years of his life. So, you know, there's the table work is in an interesting place right now. And so I sort of feel like anytime I'm interviewing a director, I want to ask them how they use the table and whether they use it or not. I'm going to start doing it too. I'm going to act like I know what it is. <laughs> I was very surprised when you were talking about Leopoldstadt to hear that there can be really pretty significant differences between productions, in this case, between the original UK production and the US premiere. But I guess cuts and changes can happen at any point in a place life. Well, yeah, I mean, this play had a really long journey to the United States. So uh, I think in some ways because of the pandemic and everything Uh, like that, there's lots of opportunities to make changes. Tony Kushner famously rewrites at least (laughs) a little bit of Perestroika every time there's a major production of Angels in America. He rewrites a bit of the second half. But, you know, yes, uh, there's... at the very least, there's usually going to be casting changes when a show crosses yeah. the pond in either direction, yeah. either from New York yeah. to London or London to New York. Some of that's a union thing. Some of that's mm. just, you know, what you can afford or, you know, for example, that the all black death of a salesman that's on Broadway right now with uh, Wendell Pierce and Sharon D. Clark has a mostly new cast from the UK version. Um, yeah. And this has a lot of new cast members and text changes, cuts, everything like that. Anytime yeah. you change actors, the interpretation is going to change. This is the one time you can't make those changes. Then that is during a production after opening night. That is a union regulated thing. That's why plays have what are called a preview period during the preview period. Um, directors and writers are allowed to make changes and you're allowed to rehearse during the day, a a shorter rehearsal, and then perform Mm -hmm. at night. I was actually involved as an assistant director in a show once where we were rehearsing new songs during the day that Mm -hmm. weren't done by the end of that rehearsal. So they were doing the old version of the show and then swapping the next night. And it was, it was crazy, but, um, you can't make those those kinds of changes mm. after opening night. Okay. Um, that's union rules prohibit it. The yep. show is open. The director gets on a plane and leaves. That's it. <laughs> and that's what actually the preview process is for. So if you're buying tickets and you see previews begin, blah, 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 blah. What that means actually is a period of time when the play is not frozen. Yeah. And some uh, theater companies do very long uh, preview periods like yes, the, Playwrights Horizons. The, Playwrights Horizons yeah. very famously skimps on uh, rehearsal period time and has a oh. very, I mean, they have like a two and a half week rehearsal, or at least they use, Great. I should say they use yeah. it. Uh, uh, Playwrights Horizons, at least they used to, the last time I checked up on it, I don't know if this is still true, have a, yeah. you know, two and a half to three week rehearsal time and then a very long preview period. And then it opens and not that long after it opens, it either extends or closes. Some yeah. of that's to protect the new plays from critics. By the time the critics yeah, yeah, have weighed yeah. in, the show yeah. is over. Um, yeah. But part of that is also they, you know, it saves it saves money. Yeah. Well, and Shakespeare in the Park does it too. But there, I guess, you know, they're going to have those seats filled come what may. And, yeah. you know, maybe they just like to keep working with those amazing actors. Um, before we say goodbye, Isaac, I want to return to your lovely question about the thrill of working with a longtime creative hero. And it got me thinking If you could collaborate with anyone, living or dead, though, if they were dead, they would revivify for this, uh, you know, experience of working with you, who would it be? Well, I really hope you'll share yours too, June. Uh, And I promise I won't answer Shakespeare, even though it would be great (laughs) to ask him some questions and maybe give him some notes about the last two acts with Julius Caesar. Uh, You know, if I could... So... If I could travel in time as opposed to resurrecting someone, it would be really great to be part of the joint stock company and working on a Carol Churchill play. I mean, that would be amazing, yes. right? Like that's that would be a yes. dream come true. But oh since God. we're not traveling in time, we're instead yanking them to our time. <laughs> I'm going to go really left field and say Iris Murdoch. And the reason why I'm going to say Iris Murdoch is, as you know, she's one of my favorite novelists, Indeed. brilliant philosopher, interesting character incredibly extra as a human being. I mean, I find her absolutely fascinating, but she also wrote a handful of plays um, and none of them are great. And so I think it'd be really interesting to collaborate with this brilliant writer and thinker and try to kind of like, how do you make this work more theatrically vibrant? I think that would be a really interesting puzzle to try to help a, a genius solve. Wow. That's an amazing answer. So since you, since you, said I would have to do it. Um, 
it's hard for me because I don't typically work in a collaborative medium. Um, you know, we've said in the past, like editing and being edited is kind of collaborative, but it's also a hierarchical collaboration. Mm. So it's hard for me to think of someone who I wouldn't just be wasting their time. Um, but there's one person that I absolutely just can't stop thinking, oh my God, how amazing that would be. And that is Victoria Wood, who is sadly now deceased. I think she's not at all known in the States. She never really tried to take her talents uh, to America, but she was an amazing comedian. She, she also wrote songs. Like She actually got her career writing topical songs on a weekly kind of consumer show. Um, she wrote several plays for television. She also did a weird spin-off from one of her TV bits that went to the West End. Uh, And she always played in her pieces. She wasn't in every performance of the West End play for whatever reason, but she was so brilliant, so funny, and also very, very Northern, which is something that, um, Northern English, that is. Uh, Just such a genius and a brilliant collaborator. I would have loved to have worked with her. And if anyone has not seen her work, there's a lot on uh, YouTube, look up Victoria Wood, an absolute genius. That sounds amazing. I'll go look her up uh, right now. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you have, remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. That way you never miss an episode. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on shows like Slow Burn and this one and the Culture Gab Fest, and you'll never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. Thank you to our guest, Patrick Marber, and to our producer this week, Zach Rosen. We'll be back next week with June's conversation with Brittany Nichols, a writer on the ABC sitcom Abbott Elementary. Until then, get back to work. This episode is brought to you by the Loyola University Maryland's Master in Data Science program. On Thursday, October 20th, Loyola will host a Night with Data Science, a networking and panel event featuring David Norton, chairman of Gill Partners, and former CMO of Harrah's and Caesars Entertainment. To register, visit loyola.edu slash data science night. Finally, your vacation has arrived, and it's completely fine that you didn't book a hotel that accepts pets. Your beloved dog will be fine staying home with a random dog sitter. What's your dog ever done for you? Let you be the big spoon? Doesn't say anything about the shocking amount of selfies you take at home. Uh Uh-oh, your favorite pants. Wow, he ate them whole. When a vacation from your pets isn't an option, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we offer pet-friendly accommodations. Hilton, for the stay.